Bill Swender, call sign Swede, was a MiG killer in the Vietnam War. Here he will tell you about how he downed a MiG-21, his missions in Vietnam, and how he fulfilled his lifelong goal of becoming a fighter pilot. Well, the inspiration came from my dad, actually, who was not in the military, but every Sunday, we lived in St. Paul, uh, Minnesota, and he would take me up to a place we called Indian Mounds, which was on, up above the uh, Mississippi River, and down below was what, what at that time was home and field, and we'd sit there and watch the airplanes take off and land. And a National Guard outfit was flying out of there, and uh, they were flying P-51s. And uh, so we'd sit there and watch, I don't know, a couple hours at least. And I was only about three years old then. Then I got into uh, watching World War II movies. I wanted to fly ever since I was that high. But I only wanted to fly fighters. You know, I'd see uh, 12 o'clock high. And I said, man, that's really stupid to sit there in this airplane, have this flak going up and you can't even maneuver. So I said, well, I think the chances are better flying a fighter. And I, that was my... My inspiration was to do that. After I became of age, so to speak, I uh, checked into the uh, aviation cadet program. And they, at that time, you needed two years of college. So I graduated high school in 52, so I went to uh, St. Thomas University there in St. Paul just to get my two years of college. I really wasted my time for two years, but I got the, the credit for two years of college. So about a month or two later, I got a letter in the mail saying I'd been accepted for aviation cadets. And my class date was gonna be in uh, December. So 30th of December, I got in an airplane at, uh, out of uh, Minneapolis. At that time it was Wold Chamberlain Field. And I got in an airplane, that was my first airplane ride fly down to uh, San Antonio to go to enter the Air Force at Lackland, the gateway to the Air Force. I forget, it was some two engine prop job. I really enjoyed that flight, it was really nice. It was at night though, you know, nice and smooth and everything. You could see all the lights and stuff. And I said, man, this is really, really kind of neat. So then I came down, uh, finished uh, basic training, it was about three months. And then uh, I went to Moultrie, Georgia for uh, pre-flight. And I flew uh, the T-34, I think it was 80 hours, and then T-28. And at that time, T-28 was a big airplane. You know, it was about the size of the World War II fighters. And um, flew that for, uh, I think it got 120 hours in it. And then finished that, that was about six months, and then went to uh, Bryan Air Force Base over at Bryan College Station, Texas, to, to fly the T-33, that was first jet. My first jet ride, they call it the dollar ride, and uh, the instructor, of course, was flying it. And uh, I'm just kind of sitting there, and he's, I think he was trying to make me sick, and he almost succeeded <laughs> doing it doing aileron rolls, he just did about 10 of them to the right, and he said, well, we'll get tired of doing that. He said, we can do them back to the left, and that's when I started feeling a little bit woozy. But I got over it, uh, I think about 110, 120 hours of T-33 time. I did have a problem landing. Uh, in fact, I was put up for a check ride to, uh, to check my landing technique, and I was I was just having trouble in the traffic pattern for some reason. And all of a sudden the light bulb came on and from that point on, no problems. Enjoyed the airplane. See, I graduated in uh, April 57 from cadets. And that morning I got my wings, I got my uh, second lieutenant bars. And that afternoon I got married to my high school sweetheart. <laughs> so it was a busy day. We went on kind of a short honeymoon, and then I was, uh, went out to Luke Air Force Base to fly the F-84F. And uh, it was a real lead sled. I'm there in uh, June, July, and August at Luke 
in Phoenix. And I mean, it was hot. And we would brief, our first briefing in the morning would be like 1.30, 2 o'clock. And uh, we'd go out and fly early morning because after, I think about 9.30 or 10, there wasn't enough runway to get that pig off the ground. And uh, as it was even uh, on, a, on a cold day, I think the 84F knew that there was, knew what the length of the runway was and then used every bit of it before it got airborne. Didn't matter if it was 10,000 feet or 8,000 feet, it used every bit of the runway. Once it got airborne, it was a good airplane. Really a uh, very good gunnery platform, very smooth, steady. The program that I went through was kind of interesting out at, out at Luke. It was uh, an MDAP program, a Military Defense Assistance Program. And it was set up, this particular uh, class was set up for German students. And there weren't any German students, so they put uh, 13 of us uh, regular Air Force guys in this class. And then when we graduated, uh, we pretty much got our pick of assignments. Assignments came through pretty good. We had, uh, I think there were, out of 13 assignments, there were 11 fighters and uh, I think one helicopter, one trash hauler. We, we drew numbers. And uh, it's kind of a funny story. I, I drew number 13 with my luck. And uh, I wanted to go overseas bad. And there was uh, two assignments to Germany, one assignment to Holland. And I didn't even know, in fact, most people didn't even know we had any outfits there. And uh, so my buddy uh, drew number two, and he wanted to go to George in the F-100. And uh, I talked him into trading with me, so I got the second choice. And I, I chose Holland, which was, when I got over there, it was the uh, kind of the country club of the Air Force in Europe. It was great. I flew into Frankfurt, and then uh, that was on the weekend. Friday, I went down to the uh, transportation office and tried to get a TR to go up to, uh, to Schusterberg, Holland. And the uh, sergeant back there wouldn't give me a TR because he thought I wanted to go to Amsterdam for the weekend. <laughs> so finally got his supervisor out there and, and they said, well, we don't have anything up in Holland. We don't have any outfits up there. And I said, well, it says right here on my orders, 32nd Fighter Day Squadron. And uh, I said, well, okay, we'll give you a TR to go up there to uh, Utrecht and uh, Schusterberg is just outside of there. And so I go down to the train station in uh, Frankfurt and I, of course everything is in German. I don't speak German, I can't read it either. And so uh, I finally stumbled around and found a platform and this train came in and fortunately there was a GI on there and I said, is this thing going to Holland? And he said, yes sir. So I threw my B-4 bag up through the window for him to take and I went over and got on it. And the name of the train was the Yugoslav Express. And I said, I wonder which way we're going. Are we going to Yugoslavia or, or are we going to Holland? And it's at night now and uh, the train, when we got to the border, it stopped and all these guards get on in, in their uniform and they're checking papers and everything and didn't speak any English, they were Germans wouldn't speak any English. And the, the funny thing about the Germans, if they got a piece of paper that they can stamp, they're happy. So I gave him a copy of my orders and he stamps it and on your way. So then I got into uh, Utrecht about, uh, about midnight, I guess. So I called the base and they sent the, the air police out to, to pick me up. Uh, so I woke up the next morning and here I am in Holland. 21 year old kid and uh, they didn't know what to do with me. I went in to meet the commander and they, <clears throat> they just, had just gotten their F-100Cs, C models, day fighter. And uh, it was known as the Queen's Squadron. She insisted that after the war that the, the US put a squadron in Holland and the beauty of it was we were under the operational control of the Dutch Air Force. We had nothing whatsoever to do with the U.S. Air Force except for logistics. 
but all our operations and everything were under the Dutch. That's where I stumbled around there for a few months and I'd ride in the back seat of a T-Bird to get my flying time for pay. And uh, every year the squadron would go down to Africa, either uh, Nur Sur in Morocco or uh, Wheelis in uh, Libya for gunnery, six weeks of gunnery, because the weather is bad up on the continent in the wintertime especially. We, were, we went down to Nur Sur for six weeks and I was a mobility officer, so I'm you know, in charge of moving the squadron and all the garbage and stuff that goes along with it. Moved down to Nur Sur and uh, sitting in a BOQ about you know, two days later, I guess. And commander and the ops officer came in and they said, uh, Swinder, do you want to fly the 100? And I said, yes, sir. And he says, okay, you're going to fly tomorrow morning with uh, Al Squires is going to be your IP. Okay. So I have never gone through any kind of ground school or anything for the F-100. I had no idea even how to start the damn thing. <laughs> I went all over the BOQ looking for, for Dash 1, you know, the, the operator's manual. And <laughs> nobody had one. So the next morning I go down to the flight line and there's Al Squires and he's a kind of a grizzly old guy. He was a, a Korean vet. And uh, so he had some, some time behind him, so to speak. And uh, we went out to the airplane and it's single seat. They didn't have any two seaters. And I got in, strapped in. He went through some switches and he said, uh, well, we don't have to worry about emergency procedures because we're not going to have any emergencies. <laughs> I said, great, that's really fine. So he said, okay, this is how you start it. And we started it. And he says, now don't do anything until I call you on the radio and check in. Okay, so a few minutes later, he called for check in. I heard our call sign was haircut. And uh, he says, haircut blue two or whatever it was uh, here. And I said, two's on. And he says, okay, let's you know, call for taxi instructions. We taxied out, called uh, to get on the runway and get on the runway and ran the airplane up. And, uh, and uh, keep in mind that I had flown nothing but the backseat of a T-Bird up to this time, which is not really a very hot accelerating airplane when you're taking off. So he's chasing me and I looked over and, and he says, let's go, let's go. So I said, okay, so. I released the brakes, ran it up, released the brakes, and, and uh, lit the afterburner. And I felt like I was just back in the BOQ someplace. I was so far behind that airplane, it was unbelievable. It was a real kick in the ass. And uh, I remember him saying, 145. And so I said, I think that's when I'm supposed to rotate, get the nose wheel off the ground. So I, 145, I pulled it back, nose wheel came up. And uh, I got airborne and started flying. And the C model doesn't have any flaps. So it, we used to call it the world's fastest tricycle at that time. I mean, it zipped along the ground pretty good. Anyway, I got airborne and next thing I hear is, it'll go faster if you pick up the gear. <laughs> I had even forget as how far I was behind the airplane. I didn't even pick up the gear. I reached over and pulled the gear up and, and it did go faster. And we went out and uh, did some air work, some aerobatics and, uh, and stuff. And then he said, uh, he says, go trail. So I went trail, he says, extended trail. I go back there and about four or five ship legs behind him. And we're flopping around the sky and, and pretty soon we're diving toward the ground toward the mountains, the Atlas Mountains. And uh, I could see a bunch of tents and things down there. And uh, we went supersonic and pulled out. And he says, God, I love to do that. And what he had done is he was supersonic and he blew those tents down. <laughs> and it was, a, it was an Arab uh, nomad tribe, I guess, that was traveling around. And he says, oh, I love to do that. And I'm thinking, man, I hope we don't have to bail out. They'll probably, there won't be much of a trial or anything. They'll just probably hang us right then and there. And then we went down to uh, 
City Slamane, which is a uh, another base south of Nur Sur. We flew down there and uh, flew a GCA pattern, and we flew it at 400 knots. And the, the GCA controller was telling us, okay, you know, I've got you on downwind now. And he says, uh, I'm turning you on base. And, and he's talking really fast because we're moving. And uh, he came down final at about 400 knots. And he said, hell, I'm going out and watch this. <laughs> he went off the air and he got out of his little GCA unit and came out and watched us uh, buzz him. And then uh, went back and, and landed. And that was my first flight in the F-100C. Uh, quite exciting. Uh, after that, I, th I think I flew just about every day, and I did get some gunnery in. Uh, we had to, at that time, we had to qualify on what we called a high and a low rag. It was a, a banner tra uh, trailing a, an airplane that they towed along, and we would uh, make passes at it and fire at it, and then they'd when they came back, they'd drop the rag at the base and they'd pick it up and then they'd count the holes in. And everybody had a different uh, uh, color ammo to shoot. Like number one might have red and two would have blue, another one have green, uh, and then another one would just have plain. And they could count those holes and that would give you your score. And uh, so I call the, the low rag was below 20,000 feet and the high rag was 20,000 and above. So you had to qualify both high and low. And uh, so I got qualified and uh, went, went back up to Schusterberg after six weeks. And I'm uh, a fully qualified, it says, uh, fighter pilot, day fighter pilot. But the funniest thing is that I didn't have enough time in the airplane or enough weather time to get into a decent category for flying. My, my uh, minimums were 1,000 feet and two miles. And if you ever saw 1,000 feet and two miles in Europe in wintertime, you were lucky. <laughs> so I didn't, didn't get to uh, fly a whole lot up there. The, the nice thing about Schusterberg, it was a three-year tour. and. Uh, when I first got there, they, they wanted to send me down to Bitburg in the F-86D. And I said, I don't want anything to do with Air Defense Command. I said, I'll just take my chances here. And that's, that's how it worked out. And uh, it was a three-year tour. And I extended for a year. And during that time, they transitioned from the 100C to the 102. And so I flew the 102 for a year. I tried to extend for a fifth year, but they wouldn't let me. It was, it was really, I mean, you talk about a country club. It was kind of like being in college, you know, very enjoyable. Every, every year on the queen's birthday, she would uh, come out and we'd stand out by the airplanes. The, the airplanes are all in uh, revetment areas that you see back in, in World War II movies and things like that, where they got the big dirt berms built around it and then the airplane is parked in there. So we'd uh, stand out in front of the airplane uh, pilot, crew chief, and an armorer, and we'd all salute her as she went by in her Rolls Royce to kind of look at the troops, and, uh, and so that was a, uh, a thrill. So we got to see the Queen every uh, every year on her birthday. And the 102, I, I didn't really care. I didn't like the mission, uh, and I really didn't care that much for the air, the airplane, although. Uh, we used to do a lot of hassling and dogfighting with, uh, with the Dutch or Germans or Belgiques or anything that was in the air we would uh, dogfight with. Uh, the 102, the two-seater was a side-by-side -side and it was a TF-102. And it was just a big piece of crap, I guess you would call it. It was, it was not, a, not a very good airplane. It looked, looked terrible to start with. Uh, the 102A was pretty good, except you couldn't get any, you didn't have very good visibility out of it. Right down the middle of the, the windscreen, there was a, uh, just like a, a piece of metal. And if you looked one side or the other, you couldn't see anything except that piece of metal. You couldn't see out, and the, uh, the canopy comes back kind of like this. And it was like having a big, uh, if you looked up, 
you looked at a like a railroad track. It was just a big wide piece of metal at the top of the canopy and if you tried to look out either side you'd bang your helmet against the side of the canopy because the canopy came down like this. So when we started, first started flying them up at Schusterberg, we'd, uh, we kept hassling and, and uh, dogfighting with whoever we could find up there. And it was good as far as turning. It turned a lot better than the uh, 100 uh, because of that big delta wing. But the radar couldn't take it. <laughs> so we'd go up and, and uh, get into a dogfight or something. We'd come back, the radar would like, psh, go blank on you, come back and write them up. And uh, maintenance finally called over to ops one day, and they said, "You guys got to stop hassling." He said, "Every time you go up and and get into a dogfight or something, it, it screws up the radar, and we got to fix them. So please stop dogfighting <laughs> with the 102s." Uh, also, there was a windmill on the uh, main highway on the way in the, between Utrecht and uh, uh, Amsterdam. And the squadron, when they moved over there from England, they had F-86 uh, birds. And they had a flight of two F-86s fly over this windmill and somebody took a picture of it, you know, the windmill and then the two airplanes coming across. So we did that with the 100 also. Uh, me and uh, Dick Bolstad. Uh, we, we flew over the, the windmills, and then we got the uh, when we got the 102. We said, "Well, we got a picture of the 102s flying over the windmill." And the weather was really crappy then. I'm leading the flight of two. They they had since uh, put in some high tension lines wires, so you had to figure out where they were and kind of get down between them, come across. And I guess I got a little bit low, and the picture was. You could tell that it was pretty low. And of course, the minimum is 500 feet. So I got back, and the, and the ops officer called me in, and he said, uh, "He said, sweet, how low did you get on that uh, pass over the windmill?" I said, "500 feet, sir." And he says, "Oh, really?" And he showed me the picture. He <laughs> took He says, "Does that look like 500 feet?" And I said, "Well, you got to look at it from an angle. You know, it's, <laughs> it looks like a little low." It was probably closer to 100 feet, but uh, we were having a hard time finding the windmill to start with, and then I just forgot about the altimeter and stuff. And so we did get a little low, but we got a good picture. I always say that uh, after Schusterberg, I was a second lieutenant after Schusterberg, my uh, career went downhill after that, because that, uh, that was really the apex of my career it was over there. When I rotated back to the States from Holland, uh, I went to uh, England Air Force Base and back into the F-100, uh, except this, this time it was the D and the F models. And uh, we would go on what they call CASF, uh, Composite Strike Air Force. We went to Turkey, we went over to, uh, to the Far East and, uh, for deployments and to sit nuclear alert usually. Our air crews, uh, we got 18 airplanes, we had 24 pilots, and we were spread out between Taiwan, Tak Li, Thailand, Da Nang uh, Air Base in South Vietnam, and Clark Field back in the Philippines. And this went on for about six months. We finally all met back at Clark and took the airplanes back to Alexandria, Louisiana. And so that was, that was the first tour, six months. Uh, we got back in October. In February, we went back over to Da Nang again, this time just to fly in-country missions in South Vietnam. No, uh, no nuke uh, commitment. So, and this, this is uh, 1965. So in February, back over there, while I was there uh, on the second tour, I got orders to go to uh, Davis Mountain Air Force Base in Tucson to check out in the F-4. And then uh, after the check out in the F-4, I was assigned to Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. 
when I first uh, got in the F-4, I said, man, this is a big son of a bitch. It's, I mean, it was a big airplane, <laughs> just looking at it. And uh, the thing I really didn't like when I first got in it, the seat was not comfortable. It was a Martin Baker seat, and there was no padding in the back for your back, and you're just kind of slumped into the thing. It, the, the seat cushion was hard as a rock, and the stick, when, when you got in, the stick was full forward. And when you wanted to, to start taxing or something, you know, you had nose wheel steering, was a little button on the, on the front of the stick. You had to haul this stick back, and it was, it had a 25 pound uh, counterweight on it, and that kept the thing flopped forward. It only took two hands to pull the damn stick back and hold it and so you could get the nose wheel steering button and then taxi out and you're holding this stick all the time against that 25 pound counterweight. When you ran up the engines, it, it was two engine airplane of course, J57s, good engine. And uh, the F-100, you couldn't take the throttle and go from idle to full military without, if you just moved it up there like that, you'd get a compressor stall and you'd get flame out the front end. With, with the F-4, you could run that stick back and forth, the throttle back and forth and, and never cough or anything and, and of course it had a lot of power and that was impressive. Uh, the takeoff technique, you pull the stick all the way back in your, in your lap and uh, when it decided it was going to fly, you could feel it on the stick that the nose would come up and continue to fly like a normal airplane. And uh, when you'd come into the traffic pattern to shoot your landing, you'd come in, brake, and pull around. And the IP that I had says, okay, now pull it around until you feel a burble. And the airplane would get a little burble, almost like an approach to a stall. And so you'd hold that burble all the way around to downwind and then uh, throw your garbage out, your gear and flaps out. And, and land, and they, uh, I had a hard time landing in it the first uh, couple of flights because the F-100, the 102, anything I'd flown up to that point, you, you come in and you kind of round out over the runway and you know, it's float a little bit. Well, the F-4 has, uh, I think it's 18, 16 or 18 inch extension on the main gear. So when it lands, the, the wheel might be on the ground, but you don't feel it because the wheel is rolling, but you got this extension on there, so you still kind of feel like you're flying. So he says, okay, he says, I'm gonna teach you how to land this damn thing. So we get out there, we're coming down final, and just bam, and it's like a Navy landing, like you're landing on a carrier. And uh, they thought that, that that was a way to do it, but they found out later that the Air Force model didn't have the strength that the Navy models had on their struts. So we were ruining a lot of struts from those landings like that. So they backed off of that a little bit. It wasn't quite a controlled crash. But uh, the airplane was very impressive, I thought. It was so, so powerful. It was like, uh, as big as it was, it was kind of like, like being in a sports car because the power was, uh, there was a lot of power and it was instant as opposed to the 100, uh, 102. I mean, you could just slam that uh, throttle up into full military power and then go into afterburner and you get a pretty good kick in the ass when the uh, burner's lit. I met Holloman and uh, after I finished my training at, at Davis Monte and went to Holloman and uh, I got there and. August, I think it was, and uh, we flew some training missions, and then all of a sudden they said, uh, okay, we're going to Southeast Asia, and uh, we're leaving in uh, February, and we're going to go to Cameron Bay Squadron, going to Cameron Bay, and we'll be flying uh, combat in South Vietnam. Well, we, we left Holloman in February, and these are pretty brand new airplanes, C models. And they're pretty brand new. They'd just gotten camouflage paint done, and uh, I think the airplane that I had only had like 12 hours on it when I took it over. Uh, so it was like a new car, it had a new car smell. 
and uh, we went from Holloman to Hickam, Honolulu, to Guam, and from Guam to Da Nang. Cameron Bay wasn't ready yet, they had, their runway was still being built. So they said, you're going to be at Da Nang for, uh, for a period of time, TDY, and then you'll go down to Cameron when they get the runway finished. So we're at Da Nang, and we flew a couple of uh, in-country missions just to get the feel of the countryside and everything, you know, not, nothing spectacular. And then uh, our sister squadron was there, the 389th, that was in 480th, 389th sister squadron was there. And we would rotate every month. One squadron would fly at night, the other one fly in the daytime. Then we'd flop at the end of the month and the squadron would fly at night, the other one would fly in the daytime. So we flew both day and night missions. Most of our night missions, we had a few up uh, in Pac-6, uh, which is the Hanoi area. Uh, in Han Haiphong, uh, up against the railroad there. We had a few up there, but most of the night missions were in Route Pack 1 and 2, which is down by the DMZ. And uh, all the day missions were in Pack 6. I mean, we, we went to Hanoi every day, uh, but most of our missions, very very seldom do we have an attack mission. Most of them were MIG cap or MIG screen uh, or escort, uh, escort the uh, wild weasels, were 105s, thuds. Every once in a while they'd throw in, uh, load us up with bombs and uh, we'd go up and, and bomb. Uh, but most, most of the missions were, were MIG cap, MIG screen. Our armament for those missions were eight missiles, four uh, sparrows, the, the uh, radar guided missiles, and four sidewinders, and three fuel tanks, external fuel tanks. The, the, the flight I was in was pretty experienced as far as uh, a lot of fighter time, flying time, but it seemed like uh, the, our flight commander was a major. Tyler G. Goodman, we used to call him Tyler II and Tippy Canoe and Tyler II. And he was a piece of work, I swear. He, uh, whenever I was leading the flight, uh, I never got below 425, 450 knots up in the combat area. And he says, Swede, we'd get back and debrief. He says, Swede, you're flying too damn fast. He said, you got to slow down and bait the MiGs in. And I said, Major, I'm a captain at the time. I said, Major, if you think I'm being goddamn MiG bait, you can go find somebody else. I said, I don't, I don't do that. I don't, I don't get below 450 knots up there. That's my, my uh, fighting speed. And uh, he said, OK, you're grounded. OK. So I go to the club and have a few drinks and come back, go to bed. And this one particular morning, I get tapped on the shoulder about 3 o'clock in the morning. And somebody's waking me up and says, Swede, you got to go brief. And I said, no, I'm, I, I'm grounded. He said, Major Goodman grounded me yesterday. And I said, no, no, you're back on, back on the schedule. Because it was a every time they had a different mission, they'd always pick me to lead it. Because I had probably the most experience in there. So this day, which, which led to the MIG kill, was, uh, was to escort uh, the uh, wild weasels. The we weasels had been getting hit by MIGs for a couple of days, and they didn't have anybody to... The, the MIG screen or the MIG cap that we had up there was usually too far away from them to do them any good. So they decided that, 7th Air Force decided that they should have escorts. So we're trying to escort this, uh, and this is the first time, escort the uh, wild weasels. And the Thud uh, 105 is a very slick airplane. And I mean, it goes like a scalded ass ape. And you can't just keep up with it. The F-4 just could not keep up with it. So I briefed, I said, okay, uh, we're gonna try and keep up with these guys the best we can. And I said, uh, I'm gonna be padlocked, which meant that I'm just watching these airplanes, 
Yeah, I'm padlocked to these uh, 105s. And of course, uh, it was a flight of three, and then two of them are camouflaged. So I'm looking down, trying to follow these airplanes against camouflaged airplanes against the jungle, and they blend in pretty well. Fortunately, number three thud was silver. He hadn't had his camouflage job yet, so I could, I could pick him up. So I just kind of follow him around, and, and whenever they made a turn, I I could cut him off in the turn. I could just follow his following straight behind him at six o'clock. I couldn't keep up with him. Uh, when the center line tank, it was six hundred gallon tank. When it uh, external, when it uh, went empty, I had briefed to go ahead and jettison it, and that would help get rid of some of the drag. So now we're just sitting there with the uh, two outboard uh, tanks, 370 gallon tanks. And uh, we had no uh, radar warning gear in, in the F4Cs at that time, absolutely nothing. The, the only warning we had about SAMs or, or MIGs or anything were Mod 1 eyeballs. And if you didn't see them, you were in trouble. If you saw them, you could uh, evade them. Uh, they're, the thuds are calling out whatever their thing is. They got a two ringer at 12 o'clock and a three ringer at two, and they're calling out these various SAM sites. Well, the only thing that helped me with, with that was they'd say at two o'clock, well, I could look over at two o'clock then, and I could look and see if there's going to be a SAM coming up. And uh, <clears throat> they went into a right-hand turn, and I said, great, so then now I can cut them off in the turn, just cut across there and, and stay up with them. And, it came around about, uh, we we're about halfway around the turn, I think, and uh, my number three man said, we got a, uh, a bogey eight o'clock high coming in. And I turned around, looked back, picked him up. It was a MiG-21, uh, and he, was, he had a pretty good head of steam up. He just kind of zipped right on through our formation. I didn't see him fire anything. I didn't see any guns or anything, and he just, he just went through us uh, like a dose of salts. And I, I had broken into him uh, at first, which is what you want to do, try and get a head on with him. But, uh, he was going too fast and he went past me and I reversed. And as I reversed, I picked up, pickled off my other two external tanks. So now I can get down to a clean airplane, fighting weight, still had full internal fuel. And uh, I thought I could pick him up as as he went by, well, we're down around six, seven thousand feet, and any time in North Vietnam, if you're below about ten or twelve thousand feet, it's very hazy. They do a lot of burning and things. There's a lot of smoke and, and haze and stuff in the air. And <clears throat> the MiG-21 is very small, and especially if you get them tail or, or nose uh, view of them, they're really hard to see. So he, he's off here in the haze somewhere. I couldn't see him. But I looked down, I saw number three uh, thud down there, the silver one, and right behind him about, uh, well, probably about a mile, I guess, maybe a little more, a mile, mile and a half, is a, a MiG-21 coming in on him. So his call sign was Panda. I said, Panda 3, you got a, a MiG coming in at your five o'clock, break right. And he said, I can't. He said, I'm getting ready to launch my missile. And he's talking about his Shrike, which is uh, launches, uh, uh, toward a SAM site, and it'll ride the, the radar beam that the SAM site's putting out, and the Shrike will just run right down that beam and, and supposedly take out the SAM site. He said, I'm getting ready to launch my missile. And I said, well, I'll do what I can. So I dove down, and my uh, previous training in, in being a day fighter in the F-100 that had guns, uh, 20 millimeter cannons, and this F-4, of course, doesn't have that. They don't have a gun at that time. So I'm thinking gun, so I'm going down this guy, and I said, now what the hell am I going to hit him with? So my backseater uh, got locked onto him, and uh, I was going to fire a, uh, a Sparrow, the radar missile, and uh, about the time I get ready to squeeze the trigger, was, I saw a break X on the, on the radar scope, so that meant I was too close. So I reached down and went from, from radar to heat. And uh, the, the si I've, I've got a lot of faith in the Sidewinder. And Sidewinder is good, but you've got to get a, a behind them. 
he got to be at his six o'clock and get a good tone on his uh, for the heat source. And I don't think I had a tone, but I didn't have anything else to do. So I squeezed the trigger anyway and uh, fired the missile. It came off, went right over the top of the MIG, and uh, didn't hit him, didn't blow up, didn't have time to arm. Basically, it was too close. I was probably only five, six hundred feet behind him. And I'm trying to slow down now. And uh, I, I didn't really want to pull out. Normally, I would pull up and do kind of a a high G roll to the outside to get some separation so I could get back in to his six o'clock. I didn't want to do that because it's because of the haze. So I'm trying to slow down and I'm kicking the rudder pedals and everything and you're on the airplane and I'm back in idle and I got the speed brakes out. And when I finally got slowed down, he's right above me. <laughs> I mean, it's almost like this looking up at the ceiling and probably about 10, 15 feet below him. And I'm kind of almost running out of ideas, and about that time, he lit his afterburner and he went climbing off. And I said, "Buddy, you just solved my problem. I got this blue sky now, and I should be able to get a good heat source." I think I had a heat source. I fired the second. I let him go out a ways so he'd get some separation, and uh, I th I really can't remember if I got the tone. Uh, from the sidewinder or not. A sidewinder, when it gets a good heat source, it growls like a dog. And your, your head said, you can hear it. And I don't re recall whether I got that or not. But anyway, he's an afterburner. I fired the sidewinder, and he came out of afterburner. And the sidewinder went out, and it blew up about the same place where he had, had come out of afterburner. I think it, it's, it detected that heat source. And then all of a sudden the heat source was gone, so it blew up. And uh, I said, oh, hell, Dwayne, we missed him again. And uh, so he settled down and got a good heat source, fired the third sidewinder, and I thought we missed him again because it just disappeared. Oh, it went right up the tailpipe is what happened. <laughs> and that's where I lost sight of it. And the next thing I know is there's this humongous fireball and pieces of stuff flying all over the place. So I pulled up, almost stalled the airplane, pulling up to get over the top of that so I didn't have to fly through it. And uh, when I rolled up over the top and looked down, the biggest thing I could see was was a wing. You know, the, the Big 21 is kind of a delta wing on it. And I could see one good piece of wing and the rest of it was just nothing. I didn't see any parachute. Uh, my number three man thought he saw a parachute when we were debriefing later in intelligence. He thought he saw a parachute. And I, I said, I, I don't see how the guy could have gotten out because the thing went right up the tailpipe. And when it blew up, it had gone quite a ways up the tailpipe, I think, you know, which would put him pretty close to the cockpit. And uh, so I, I, don't, I don't think the guy got out, but that's neither here nor there. After I pulled over this uh, fireball and I looked down and there's that silver thud right below me and he's turning to the right so they turned to the left and I caught up to him and escorted him out of the area and uh, went back and on the way back uh, my number two man had got thrown out of the, the flight. He was a young lieutenant and when I had initially made that uh, turn into the first MiG and then reversed my turn, he got thrown out of the, the formation. And uh, he was trying to rejoin uh, the flight, and so he's coming back at our, our six o'clock, and he's coming, he's, he's about uh, five miles behind us, and um, the, the second MiG-21 pulls up right in front of him, and he was coming after us. And uh, so my number two man, <laughs> fired a sidewinder and the missile went out and blew up alongside the airplane and the guy ejected. The MiG pilot ejected, so we got two MiGs that day. And then as we're flying back, and, and he never said anything. And when he joined up with the flight again, I'm looking over there and I said, Dwayne, my back's here, I said, Dwayne, didn't he have four sidewinders when we took off? And he says, yeah, I think so. I said, well, one is missing. I said, I don't know when the hell he fired that, and he hadn't said anything. And we didn't know that he had 
gotten a MIG until after we got back to Da Nang and debriefed with intelligence. And, and the intel officer came over and he says, your wingman got an airplane, or got a MIG today too. So I got there in February and I came back uh, the 1st of October and uh, went to davis Monthan as a F-4 instructor. I was there four years and then uh, I went to uh, Bergstrom, 12th Air Force Headquarters in the standardization evaluation section and I flew the F-4 and the F-100 and I'd give uh, check flights to pilots including the National Guard. We had all the guard, responsible for all the guard units west of the Mississippi and at that time all the, most of the guard units had F-100s and they transitioned from the F-100 to the F-4 the only problem is it <clears throat> interrupted my uh, home life a little bit because flying two airplanes, the F-100 and the F-4, I'd have to go fly the 100 about one week a month, and then I'd have to go fly the F-4 about a week a month, and then we would have a visit, uh, an inspection or something, and that took another week. So, I mean, I, I was living out of a suitcase three weeks a month. And it uh, got kind of old, but it was fun. So I got a couple of flights in the F-16. One, one of the funniest things, the F-16 has got a side stick controller and the first ones that came out, the stick didn't move. I mean, it was a rigid stick. And it was kind of unusual to, instead of having your stick down here between your legs, you got it over here on the side now. And it's, it's a, pretty much a computer airplane. And the IP I'm flying with, I said, you know, you just put a little pressure on that stick and it does what you're trying to do, you know. You just put a little pressure on the front of it and it climbs. And I said, what happens when you squeeze a stick? And he says, I, he says, I don't know. And I said, so I just gave it a good squeeze and the airplane goes, blah, 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 just <laughs> all over the place. Computer didn't know what to do. After an illustrious career of flying fighters, Swede went on to be a driver, a math teacher, and a community college professor. He and his family ultimately settled in Texas. Thank you for watching this episode of Legends of Aviation. Please like and subscribe so you can catch upcoming episodes featuring more MIG killers.